welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're down in a day in the depths of Cornwall, down here at Gwenier Angling. Down in a day to get together with Aaron Ensley. Now, Aaron's a local top rod builder, which is based here at Gwenier Angling, and we're going to go into the shop now and go through some general hints and tips about general rod building itself. Okay, guys, here we have the man himself. Aaron's Ensley, how are you doing, buddy? Yeah, you really, mate? not too bad. How are you doing? So, this is your basic workshop where it all goes down. Yeah, that's yeah? right, yeah. So, how long have you been actually um, situated here? Um, here, I've been here just after Christmas. Yep. Um, it's currently my kind of part time workshop. I do a lot of work from home as well. Um, but obviously, the benefits of being in a tackle yeah. shop. Um, it brings in a lot of work. Keeps you busy. And it offers a service to the shop as well. Yeah. Um, you know. So it's not just sea rods, it's carp rods, all different styles of fishing Yeah, rods. Um, I guess that's why I've kind of progressed um, full-time work with rod building because I get such a diverse amount of different types of rods yeah. coming in. Um, my passion in fishing is lure fishing, yeah. but I do find myself probably doing a lot of carp rods. Obviously, there being lakes, we get a lot of carp anglers come in, um, but I do a lot of sea rods as well. Yeah, so here we have a Ziplex, what you're about to build now. Yep. You're actually doing them in um, the 7HT Dower colours as well, which is a nice touch really, it's something yeah. different as well. Yeah. I've okay. actually seen a picture of one of the ones you've done on any fish anywhere rod, absolutely yeah. cracking, cracking job. And uh, how long have you been doing it for then, Aaron? Um, I've been doing it full time probably for the last five years. Yeah. Um, um, prior to that, I was doing it as a hobby, as most rod builders do. Yeah. Um, probably on and off for about three or four years. Yeah. Um, until I was confident to kind of take on people's rods, people's pride and joy. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a rust. It's a big step, especially when you've got like a ziplex <laughs> yeah, and the sentries and stuff like that. Yeah. But you, you obviously got a passion for it, and um, yeah, the absolutely. quality, what comes out of it at the end of the day is phenomenal. Mm. Um, you've won some awards, I've seen on your. On, I have done, yeah. yeah. Um, international awards as well, actually. The, the Americans are quite flamboyant. So, yeah. Um, it's, um, it was quite a good. Good it's a very good achievement there, yeah. as well. It takes a lot yeah, of yeah. absolutely. I can yeah. see it's you something you take a lot of pride in, mm. and I think you have to when you're doing this this type of work as well. Definitely, but yeah. At the end of the day, it's um. Yeah, I do, I do, I do get a bit of a sad moment saying goodbye to some. I of bet you did. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at one of the white ones you done the other day actually. With the zip yeah. it's, right. It looks a bit different, and um, yeah, to be honest, yeah. it looks quite nice. And I think mm. in the night time that would have an amazing effect. You yeah. have your lights going up on it. It was completely Definitely. white and. Yeah, so um, so what are you doing actually on this one now then? I've taken them, they were in a bit of a state and they were well used. Um, so I've taken them back to bare carbon. They've been recolored black. Um, I've had multiple layers of varnish that are nice and tough. Um, we've had some new stickers made up here. And the stage we're at now is putting the guides on. Right. The fun bit. So with the guides, guides especially then, so what do you do when you're obviously spacing them? Because uh, this is something I got told the other day about when, when they're putting the, the, the eyes on the rod, when yeah. the rod's bent over and compressed, yeah. none of the lines to touch any of the blank. It should be touching all, right. the, all the rings. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you want a nice steady progression. Your line should really match the curvature of your rod. Yeah. Um, there is rod spacings out there um, and that is a brilliant way to get started and um, to start off on a build. Um, and at that point what I would do and what other rod builders would do is a static test. So we will mask and tape the guides onto the rod, we'll yeah. run a line through the rod and um, have a weight on the end and we'll actually physically see how the line travels through yeah. the rod and we're able to adjust the guides by eye okay. until it looks something like it. Yeah. So is that is it are, are Ziplex uh, they have like a spec for each rod or each rod builder has its own like take on whether put on? Yeah, um so there's I mean with the butter section, we'll start with the butter section, you've got guys that fish with uh, a reel in a down seat position or up seat position. So obviously that's going to increase the distance between your reel and the butt guide. So you would um, you would change the position of your butt guide a a accordingly to that fishing style. Um, obviously then that increases the gap between the butt guide and the first guide on the tip. Yeah. So you then have to adjust the, the guides on the tip. Um, but everything's normally dictated by the butt guide. Um, for fishing style and the position of your guides on the tip are dictated by the curvature of the rod. Okay. 
So, so one of the first things when getting getting the rod, obviously you've got your blank here now, is is finding the spine of the rod. That's right. Yeah. How do, how do you specifically? Because I, I would take that's quite a hard thing to do. Absolutely any, not. No. It, it's it's completely down to feeling. Um, it can't be interpreted wrongly. Um, if you know how to do it, um, you could walk into a shop and you can do it to every rod on the, sh on the shop. Straight away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's that easy, actually. I think people would take something from learning it, even if they're not rod building. Okay. It really gives you an idea of the quality of the rod and the workmanship and the and, and the input that's gone into a factory-made rod. rod. And you can really get a good idea yeah. of the quality. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take long to do. Um, you could take a rod from your shelf and you could practice it and learn how to do it fluently in 10 minutes okay so um, that's a very big part of the rod build I, I presume as well there's there's differing opinions on it but um again i think it i think it, it is really a signature of the quality of a, a, of build, a factory yeah. rod um it doesn't take me 10 seconds to spine a rod when no. it comes in for a rebuild so as a as a matter of good practice i always spine my builds yeah um whatever someone's opinion is on whether it makes a difference to a rod or not i think there's no harm in in just doing it doing it right yeah, yeah. that's that's one of the so that's things. that's what i do so starting off now then we've got you, you're about to put the top eye on so obviously you've you spaced that out to the accordance to the spacings yeah. of the build mm -hmm. um so obviously for a lot of guys who don't know each individual rod will have a difference. You might have a light ground, right, light rod, uh, mixed ground rod, and rough ground rod. Yeah. On that, normally that would determine where the spacings go. Is that correct? Yes, that does. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I mean, these are quite a, a, a low diameter, like casting rod. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I would suggest you probably have them in a, a down seated position. Yeah. You've got reducers on here as well. Um, so we've got the guide up quite high. Um, so with this, um, the guide is actually quite close to the to the joint here. So we're in we incorporate the the whipping on the joint um, with the, the with the leg of the guide as well. So um, we'll have some solid whip to the end here, yep. and, and then we'll have a section here of whipping. Um, so yeah, this, this is where I place this this guide on this rod. Okay, so normally for sort of to main do the eyes of the rods, mm -hmm. just that part of the rod build. What does that normally take for time wise? Um, the the whipping. Um, I mean, the length of time that it takes to do the whipping. Uh, I mean, it's it, it can differ quite massively. I mean, just having an extra trim band can really draw out a build. Can it? Yeah, it can do. Yeah. Um, it, and then when you start getting up towards the tip, the whippings become smaller and at a lower diameter, they become very fiddly. At this stage on the butt, um, everything's very quick. Yeah. It's, it's very big and bold. Um, you've got very large trim bands. Um, it's easy to be quite quick with it. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now, obviously we're, we're going to watch now with the cameras yep. um, to go through with you putting the basic eye on and then I think you're going to give some guys some hints and tips to take away for these because a yeah, lot of guys definitely. with like um, shrink, shrink tubing and stuff like that, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, a lot of guys can be very put off by doing that. And it's mm -hmm. a simple thing they can do at home Absolutely, most of the time, yeah. an easy thing they can do. So. I mean, yeah, I mean stuff like shrink tube and tip eyes and stuff like that you can, you can buy in tackle shops and they are there as a as a means of maintaining and servicing your own gear, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you can if you can learn how to confidently put on things like shrink tube or replace a tip eye, um, you know you're not relying on a on someone else to do it in a in a hurry so you can get out fishing again. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a simple thing which is I do have other skills to do really yeah, when it comes to yeah. obviously the main eyes and different things in mm -hmm. the building. This is something what you would want a rod builder to um, obviously use his service for, but yeah. sometimes it all happens to us all. We rod falls yeah. over, a tip eye comes off. It's uh, it's nice to be able to know and have the skills to be able to put it back on, especially shrink tubing as well. Because I remember when I um, had a go at it once, I, uh, had, I had hot water, I, I think, trying, and I'd done it with a hair dryer, and it, yeah, and it was quite yeah. fun, and it took me ages, but I got there. Yeah, yeah. But um, normally, I, I don't, I don't bother. I normally send them to a specialist like yourself um, mm -hmm. because you know you've got the quality there, and it's done. It's a, it's a quality job at the end of the day. 
Well, that's why I got into rock building. It's, it's that sense of accomplishment and looking after your own gear and looking at something and go, I did that, that's quite cool. I can see it. Yeah. And when you're catching fish on your own gear and your yeah. own work and even your own rigs, there is a there's a sense of pride, isn't there? And, Definitely. And, and, and there's a thing of being self-efficient as well, you know? If you, yeah. If you can repair a tip eye on the rocks, it's the difference between staying out on a good session and having some fish or going home. Yeah. All for the sake of a, a tip eye that would cost a, a couple of quid to replace so you could definitely uh, benefit from learning a few little bits and bobs and maintaining your gear. Okay then so what we're going to do now is we'll go through um, putting the main top eye on and then we'll go into some shrink tubing. Yeah. Right I'm just starting the under wrap on this guide so I've measured the distance between the feet here um, and it's going to sit like this so um, as we've discussed we're going to go with the um, the Dio HT reels so we've got uh, a nice little gun smoke here we've got some metallic red and we've got black for his main wrap so let's put start with the trim bands this is all held in place with masking tape nothing fancy here um, and I'm using a power wrapper a lot of people do this by hand and I'll do a lot of my delicate stuff by hand but as I start getting a bit of rhythm, I can take my hands away and I can run it on the motor here. Which just speeds things up a little bit. On to the main wrap here. Just getting everything loosely in place at this stage and then I use this yellow tool here called a burnishing tool just to set everything in place as we tighten things up right so I'm at a stage now where I want to start tightening things up and getting it all tidied up right so now I'm going to move this tag in Is the start of our under wrap. It's going to burnish these gaps out here, and I'll do that as I go along. Just getting them out. It's easy to uh, it's easy to do it as I go along and try and sort it out at the end. Um, is it nice? It's quite quick from this stage. I put a centre band on this, so I'm going to measure the, the the distance here and then get a nice half line. We've got 32 millimetres, so I make that 16. So I'll lightly score the, the centre mark here for the centre band. Now I put in something called a pull through loop. So it's just a section of thread here. And we just slot that under the, the whipping like so. And then I will whip again up to the centre line. Burnishing as I go along. put a black centre band on this one. So take a section of thread here. Right, so we go back to our pull through loop here. And we're just gonna pull this tag put this tag in through the loop and just pass that through, lock it in place. 
then we're gonna just add a center band here. five wraps there for our centre band. And we'll start whipping again. Just again, burnishing out our gaps as I go along. I can now cut this tag end off and continue with the red yep. I'm approaching the end of my wrap here so I'm going to come back to a, uh, a pull through loop just to tie everything off so um, I like to have at least ten wraps just to hold it in place at the end of my, um, my at the end of my wraps, and then I'm I'm certain it's nice and tight, and it doesn't spring out on me when I when I cut it at the end, and then I have to start it all over again. So I'm approaching this line here. Mm, I'm happy that's nice and even. Right, we're going to finish this off again with the the gun smoke here. I'm going to take some gun smoke metallic to finish it off, and we're going to put this one through the pull through loop and our red, like so. Bring that through, pull that way through. I'm going to put another pull through loop in um, gun smoke I've done four wraps on this side and I'll, I'll duplicate that and put four wraps on this side as well so everything's all nice and symmetrical we've got three we've got four put this tag end off This one through, there we go, like that. Make sure we're nice and tight on our gaps. Just to eliminate any gaps. Happy everything's in place, so I'll now trim off my tag ends. And that is our under wrap for our guide. So we've finished the under wrap now for our guide. We're going to place our guide in place. Everything's all nice and symmetrical. So um, I've, as I discussed with Andy earlier, I've, I've spined this rod so I know where my um, the line that my guides will be running down and um, this will be sitting in line with the sticker that I applied previously right so our guides in place um, I can adjust this guide um, to be in line um, after I've whipped it um, it's not too tight that I can just make some small adjustments so um, I'm not too fussed at this stage about it being completely dead on. Right again we'll start our wrap with um, this gun smoke here. Now, there's no rule how long your guide wraps are um, but I like to keep them roughly the same as the under wrap on the butt guide just, just because I think it looks cosmetically um, a little bit better but some people have a different preference some people like a longer wrap some people like quite a short wrap um, but yeah, I like to keep everything kind of uniform and, and that works for me. So, 
So again, um, as I did with the with the under wrap, I've got four bands of metallic. I usually work in twos. So if I have four bands of one colour, I might have um, six bands of uh, another colour, or I might double it and have eight bands of another colour. Again, instead of the pull through loop this time, I'm just using a bit of masking tape to keep that in place. Trim that off so we've got bits of loose thread all over the place. All right, we're going to put in a red. On this one, I'm going to put in six bands just so it kind of graduates up towards the black a little bit nicer. Three, four, five, six, and again I'll bring that one up to the masking tape here. Okay, right. right, so again, moving with the burnishing tool on at this, you know, I can sort out all these gaps at the end, but it's good practice to do it as you go along, and it just makes it a uh, easier job when you're finished. Um, right, we're moving on to the black main wrap here. I use a um, just a normal standard nylon, not a colour preserved. I find that goes like a, a tint, tinted kind of blue when the epoxy goes on. So I use a standard nylon. I use a grade D. Um, grade A is fine. Um, but I just find it a little bit more difficult to to go over the guide feet. So with a quite large guide like this, you probably find that using a, a grade D um, just kind of makes the job a little bit easier. Now what I normally do with guides is um, grind down the foot, but um, these particular guides um, they've been pre-ground and. Um, that just helps whipping up the guide foot. On some guides it's quite bulky and um, you definitely have to grind them down with something like a Dremel or a file just to make that transition a little bit smoother so your thread goes over the top of it. Right. So I've whipped here by hand um, just enough to hold these trim bands in place. I'm going to take these tag ends out. and start tidying things up so I can continue with my main wrap. It's a little bit fiddly at this stage but and it looks messy before it looks neat. I'm just pushing everything in place again. Happy with everything in place, I will trim those trim bands. Right, I'm happy there. Get these trim bands out of the way. There we go. Trim that out of the way. Right. So we're now ready to continue with the main wrap and again I'll go on the foot pedal now just because it's quite a distance it just uh, makes it a little bit quicker for me right, so make sure everything's aligned and off it goes right I'm approaching the foot here and um, I like to do this bit by hand just to, just to help it over the foot because there is a little bit of a transition here. Let's just start approaching the foot. I'll just guide it over with my fingers.
Right, I'm happy with that now. So I can carry on with the main wrap. I'll wrap over the foot. Everything's looking nice and neat and straight. Uh, we'll continue the wrap now. Right, I'm approaching the end of the wrap. So we're going to put a pull through thread here. The same as before. A little scrap bit of thread. Some people use a bit of fishing line. I'm not that organised. Um, but yeah, just a, just a short bit of thread. Comes uh, to the end here. Well, I'd slow up at this stage because the thread can overlap on the under wrap. So it does, does help to go a bit slow and just guide it in by hand. Place that through the pull through loop, like so. Give it a think tight. And pull the end of the tag in, like so. Trim this off. And pull through. And then I'll burnish everything nice and flat and in place. And that is one foot done. So shrink tubing, now to me this is a very, very important part of the job. Um, and a lot of, lot of people obviously when they're getting rods and different things, some guys like to do that themselves. Yeah. It can be tricky. I, I know out of, out of personal yeah, experience yeah. to be honest mate. Um, and I was sitting there with boiling water, I think I had it on first, and uh, I got uh, someone told me a little trick with a hairdryer. Yeah. How would you do this as you're about to show us? Well, starting at the initial purchase, um, shrink tube will come typically in three sizes. Okay. So you've got 20 mil, yeah. 25 mil, yeah. 30 mil. Okay. Now one thing to consider, is if you had a 30 mil butt, you would make the assumption that you would need a 30 mil shrink tube. Um, it starts off at 30, and it will reduce in size. Okay. So as a general rule, um, if you just take it as an example, on your rod, for example, um, you've got a 24 mil, a roughly 24, 25 mil butt. Mm -hmm. We would buy a 30 mil shrink tube to shrink it down, and that would reduce to that size okay it, it reduces about a third yeah so if you if you remember that as a kind of a goal yeah, yeah. that helps with your initial okay. purchase um so what you're going to show the guys now is a, is a basically is some hints and tips now with general rod building and yeah this is really good to obviously take in guys because a lot of a lot of people uh will obviously would, would want you to come through with aaron it was very important to aaron when we done this today was to give some information back and educate people with with some general hints and tips on rod building and that's yeah. what i think it's, it's a good point as yeah. well to put out to people and definitely it's, it's something they can do themselves if they get a rod mm -hmm. they want to do it, it's quick and easy yeah. and simple and it's um it's the right way of doing it and, and obviously yeah. the educational side of what we're about to do as well so should we go for it Ralph? yeah Brilliant. absolutely right so um there's a couple of varieties of shrink tube. Um, there is what's known as like a Japanese diamond wrap, um, which has like a texture to it. Um, it's it's you can it's very distinctive. You can see like a cross diamond shaped pattern going up it. And then you get what's called um, like Japanese plain shrink wrap. Um, this is what you would typically find on fit, uh, rods like any fish anywhere, sentry rods. It's a very popular. Um, shrink wrap is very robust, it's quite thick and it has a nice texture to it. Um, now most shrink wrap comes in one and a half meter lengths which is plenty for most rods. Um, in fact I, I usually have quite a lot left over to do things like reducers and um, some people like a little bit of shrink tube at the top of the joints just for ease of pulling them apart. So um, when I measure the rod, I will actually overcut the shrink tube. Um, there's plenty of excess um, that I can do that. I don't have to measure exactly. 
uh, and and the main reason for that is um, we're we're applying temperature and and um, and there's different variables involved that will reduce the length of the shrink tube when it's on the rod. So rather than cutting it to the right size prior to fitting it, um, it's easier to trim at the end just so you, you make sure that there is plenty on the rod and you haven't cut yourself too short. So we're applying the shrink tube now. There's a few ways to apply this, um, but yeah, we're, we're applying heat. Um, so what's important with uh, with the rod is that we don't apply too much heat so we don't damage either the shrink tube but more importantly we don't damage the rod um, so there's a few ways we can do it we can use boiling water um, just for an example we could use a hairdryer or a heat gun um, but the important thing is is that we can control the heat and and we can move the heat away from the rod if it becomes too hot um, the pitfall we use in water is you need to have a lot of water and you need to be able to apply it over a period of a length uh, and have a consistent temperature throughout and it's a little bit harder to control that way. A hair dryer is fine, it doesn't really get to any kind of temperature where you can do it in any kind of rush. I actually use a naked flame and it's just a little hand bunts in here. I know not everyone has one of these in their home. Um, using a naked flame you have to be quite careful because um, it, it's, it's probably the hottest method to use. Um, but I, I will actually spin mine in the, in the lathe so it's, it's not in direct contact with the flame for any period of time that it would damage the rod. Um, now I work from one end to the other and the reason why I do that for is as this reduces and shrinks to the rod um, it's going to leave a void air in one end. So if you start at one end, it will push that air all the way to the end and you won't be left with any air bubbles in the middle. If you start from one end to the other, you're going to be left with a big air bubble in the middle and it'll look a bit daft um, and it's quite hard to get out, so you don't want to do that. So I'll start by rotating the rod with a naked flame. And you can see that starts reducing and already we've got about an inch down there uh, it's quite boring work but um yeah it's just about patience um, and i'll just feel the temperature of the rod as i go along make sure i'm not cooking it that's fine like i said i'm applying this quite quickly so um, it, the flame isn't in contact with the blank long enough that we're going to cause any damage You could use the same method with a power wrapper, rotating the blank with a heat gun or again a hair dryer. Um, obviously you wouldn't want to use hot water because we've got electric here but, but yeah I use, uh, I use this Bunsen. Um, I should make a note actually, I wouldn't use anything like a, a naked flame from a candle or a match or a lighter for example. Um, this is an alcohol lamp so it doesn't soot so it won't leave any marks on the blank. If you use a lighter or a match, and it's particularly important to to make a note of this with when you're when you're applying heat to your epoxy, for example, it will soot and it will leave a, it'll leave a sooty residue on your rod. Working from one end to the other. Again, we just check the temperature. That's just warm. It's, n it's nothing hot that I'm concerned about. Again, I'll carry on.
Right, we've reached the end here, and the correct way to um, to finish this off would be to um, put a length of whip in, and we would epoxy up to there. Um, that would be make it just look nice cosmetically. It's you can you, they can um, pull back a little bit, but um, if you've stretched it while supplying it. Um, that's what's going to cause that problem. So as long as you put it on slowly and you don't stretch it as you're putting on um, maybe just a bit of electrical tape on the, over the end there just to seal it up stop any horrible fishy smells going in there um, then um, leaving it like that should be um, should be suffice. Um, at the butt end we took typically tuck the shrink tube into the end and then we will apply a butt cap. Mm -hmm.